Welcome to today's class is sponsored by Anonymous in the memory of Edward David Shaul and also in gratitude for the impact of the classes. Uh, Morris and Stella Miri in California in memory of Stella Mordechai uh, Amiri. One second, one second. It's just playing games. It's fun. Okay. Morris and Stella Miri in California in memory of Stella's father. Jonathan Sky in memory of Benjamin Aryeh Ben Arye. Mark Benedek, and thanks to uh, gratitude, anonymous in the honor of Karen Belcheva and Isaac Ben Baruch for the Zivug and a life driven Torah success in memory of Baruch Ben Mordechai. Um, Rachel Leah Rodban in memory of Mehir Yechiel and Yosef Ben Rachelea and Fushalema Brachan Teshuvah. Yosef Ben Chaim Weisberg in the merit in, from Ramat Ben Chemish in honor of the fifth wedding anniversary that they should have more, many years together. Amen. Anonymous Amen. in memory of Aliyah Ben, Sarah, Chaim Shmuel Bet Aliyah, Chana Shlomo Chaya Fagel, for Bitachon and Wisdom. Amen. All right, welcome everybody. Um, just to tell everybody, we have in about two months, we're going to have a major event in Manhattan. We're going to have a big, 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 big event in Manhattan. We have a few, few events scheduled in New York coming. So that's the, that's the announcements. Okay, today's class, we're going to talk about... Get this out. Today's class, we're going to talk about the power of desire. It's a very, very powerful class today. Let me tell you a little bit on how I got to this class. You know, always, always something happens in my life before I get this epiphany on what to talk about. I think now we have over, I don't know, 700 classes. So I'm like, okay, what am I going to talk about now? And somehow, all of a sudden, these new classes come to me. So I had, I, my rabbi was, came into town on Thursday. And he gave me a story about Rav Zusha. Rav Zusha and Rav Eli Melech, whose yurt site was a couple days ago. He said something very powerful. He said that they, were both, they both decided to exile themselves. Because, you know, today the, the Shekhin is in exile. So back then they put themselves in exile. So basically they went through the forest and they went basically hiking and hiking and hiking. And all of a sudden they were completely exhausted. All of a sudden what happened? They were sitting in the, in the, in, in, underneath a tree. And all of a sudden, a Polish drunk driver comes in and says, help me with my stuff. The, the driver completely crashes, all his belongings are, are gone. And all of a sudden, he's yelling at the two rabbis, help me with my stuff. So they said, listen, we can't, we're exhausted. So then the Polish driver says, you can, you just don't want to. You can, you just don't want to. They said they learned more from that conversation with that, with that guy than, mo than from mostly all the Torah books in the past. What is that telling us today? There's a lot of stuff in our lives that we can, but we just don't want to. And, it's, and it, this is exactly the point. And that same day, it, it's not working properly. That same day, I was at the gym with my trainer. And I'm telling him, listen, I'm, I'm, I can't take it anymore. It's too much. I'm, it's, it's too much. I'm exhausted. So then a little voice came into my mind and says, you can, you just don't want to. I said, aha, that's tonight's class. You can, you just don't want to. We're going to talk about today about the power of desire. Ramachman has many, many, many Torahs. So we have to understand something. Everybody has an obstacle in heaven. And that specific obstacle in heaven is set up specifically for the individual in order to test him for free will. So one guy might have a problem with trauma. Another guy might have a problem with anger. Another guy might have a problem with food addictions. Another guy might have a problem with drug addictions. Everybody has that problem. Everybody has that lack in life in order to test them, to get them closer to God. You have to understand that. Nobody has it easy. But Nachman clearly said a long time ago, he says, everybody's going through major suffering in this world. The people that spend time working on their soul, the people that spend time seeking meaning in their life, they have a little bit of, of, of happiness. But it's not, it's not where you're going to have permanent happiness 24 hours a day. That's not a realistic thing. And this is against really all the books that you know you hear today. Be, if I'm not happy 24 hours a day, something's wrong with me. I must be depressed. I need medication. And Rav Nachman clearly said, this is not the case. Because the purpose of darkness is to test you. The purpose of darkness is so you can get tested, ultimately you can have free will. We gave this example all the time. What would be the point of going to a soccer game with no goalie? You won 100-0? Basically the world had to be created with enough chesed 
which is benevolence and enough judgment. If you had too much chesed in the world, what would happen? Then you would take everything for granted. You wouldn't, you, everything would come easy to you. You would eventually become spoiled and you would take everything for granted. If you had too much judgment in the world, what would happen? You wouldn't be able to take it. So the world is created with the perfect perfection of chesed and gevura in order to test free will. Because the purpose of our, in this world is really is to crown God. It's to, it's to find God in our darkness. It's more important that a person, and I see the key in success with many people, the people that spend more time overcoming darkness than trying to figure it out, succeed much more in different areas of their life. <coughs> different areas of their life open up. But if you're just focusing on why darkness happened to you, then you're going to get stuck on trauma 101. And unfortunately, if this is not taught, if you don't know how the system works, a person can, can see what happened. What happened to my life? I felt like I got, I got abandoned. And that itself is the, is the darkness itself. So that's why, you know, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I, I, I'm in recovery, I'm, not, I'm in gambling recovery, but I, obviously I teach classes in my in rehab center, and it's, it's clearly not, the, people don't understand the, pur the purpose of light and the purpose of darkness. Our sages say that in the same forest that you're lost, is where, is, it's where is going to come the axe in order to get you out. The same forest, the same forest where you think you're hopeless. That's exactly where you're going to get the axe in order to chop the tree. That's the handle for the wood. So we need to say, usually, usually our darkness points in our life is the biggest light. In, and this is the idea of chasidut. Psychology is trying to figure out the problem all the time. Chasidut tells you, find meaning in the, in the darkness and spend more time creating light than understanding it. That's the biggest shift that you see. Otherwise, you just stay in those problems forever. But Hasidut tells you every moment is a brand new moment. You were just born. And the lacking in life is for you to get closer to God in that lacking. That's Rabbi Nachman 101. It's, it's, it's the clear, clear, clear. But if we don't understand those typical rules of life, then we can get very lost in life. Very, very important. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Because I can't tell you, just smile all day long. No, you're going to have days where you're going to have clarity. You're going to have days where you're going to have darkness. You're going to have days where you're going to be up. You're going to have days where you're going to be able not to even to move. That's normal. How do you like that? It's only where the darkness becomes so hard in your life that you can't function, then you got a problem. But if you don't, if you don't accept and, and know how to deal with darkness and, how, and know how to plan for darkness, then a person's going to get lost in this world. He's going to get lost to addictions. He's going to get lost to... Uh, a, a pain that doesn't really exist. It's part of creation. And specifically, we're going to talk about that God made the world specifically with a built-in failure. Before He created the world, He destroyed the world to teach human beings that this is part of life. So I said, everybody goes through some kind of trauma in their life. And, and the key is, what do you do next? What do you do next after that trauma? I went through many traumatic things. But this is why most people get, they leave spirituality. It's because they had trauma, they don't understand it, and that's it. Bye-bye, you lost the customer. But if you understand the trauma, if you understand the darkness is the, is the beginning of the light, then you actually want to approach God instead of avoid God. And, uh, and it, it's, it's such a huge, huge thing. And unfortunately, this is not taught in, in many schools. It's not taught in yeshiva. Resilience is not taught today. And I think that's what my, my, many of my classes are, are getting people to be more resilient getting people to be more prepared, not getting smacked in the head, next thing you know, you don't know where you are. So that, that's really, really, really key. So the key is, to get, we, we need to spend more time on where we're going than how we got there. Because if you spend too much time on the obstacles, what happens, you're never going to get out. We have to say, what does this mean to me? What's next? So we have to get our mind off where we are and get our mind off where we want to go. If you spend all your time on where you are, you're done. If you spend your time on where you want to go, that's the, that's the next move. It's a big message. These are, these, are, these are very simple lines that can make a huge difference. Otherwise, a person becomes, you know, you can become spiritually constipated. <laughs> stuck in with negative emotions, emotional constipation. What is it? The guy's stuck. He doesn't understand. He's got grief. He's got this. And you never walk around with any kind of simcha. We need to understand that happiness, simcha, is what connects us to God. So let's take a book. We're going to take a few, a few books from a few teachings. 
Uh, we're going to talk about Lesson 48, Lesson 66. Uh, we're going to talk about this book called, from Rabbi Rush, it's called The New Light. And he talks about here this concept of bread of shame. Originally, all the souls in heaven, they were connected directly to the source. That means they received light without, without working for it. There's a great example. Imagine going to a wedding that you're not invited to. How would that feel? You couldn't eat. You couldn't eat. You would feel so much shame because you didn't get invited. And it would, no matter what you got in this world, you just couldn't hope, you couldn't deal with it. You would have to eventually walk out. Why would you walk out, to, 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 why would you walk out of a wedding where you're getting everything for free? Because your soul says, I didn't earn this. The same thing in life. Why are we so against people that want to get things fast? Why are we so against the dishonesty? It's because originally all the souls were cling to that. So in Kabbalah, there's this concept called the bread of shame. So if it's not for the struggle that you go through, you don't get the reward. You understand? The struggle itself, it's to get you away from the bread of shame. The bread of shame is basically saying, I can't accept things for free. The struggle is where you, where you find the results. So people don't want to struggle, but if you didn't struggle, you don't build the vessel to the new light. So it's like, you can't complain about the struggle, you just have to get going. Because the more you complain about the struggle, it's basically telling, I don't want to work, I want everything for free. I don't want to deal with it, I want, the, I want to go to the wedding for free, I don't want to be invited. What kind of life would you have? You would have a miserable life overall. So it, the system is made where there is a concealment, that's where the word haolam, which is world, in haelam is concealment. The concealment itself in life gives free to free choice. So let's say two people have trauma. One tries to what? Transform his emotions. Another one tries to numb their emotions. Because everybody goes through pain. But without spirituality, the person can't find meaning. He can't find anything else in his life. So it's, it's, a, it's a natural reaction for a person to want to go to drugs and to want to, 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 want to escape from, from darkness. It's not a... It's not like the person's abnormal. It's a normal reaction for a person to escape the normal deficiencies. Sometimes people with heroin addicts, they get a sense of warmth. They're not going there to get to a, to a super high. They, get, they felt like somebody's giving them a hug. It's a sense of wholeness. It's not like they're tr bad people. It's just that they're not coping with their darkness the right way. But So the, the addiction in life is, is really, it's, it, it's a normal reaction. One of the reasons why a lot of people they, they're, they're, they're struggling a lot is because they think they're the only ones with these issues. And like I said, last week I was in Beverly Hills, the nicest synagogue probably, the richest neighborhood in the world, you could probably say. Synagogues of, uh, I went to a singles event there, I spoke at a singles event, 500 people there. And not too many smiles. Plenty of money, but no smiles. So you would figure, you, you figured you got it all. You're in Beverly Hills, you got this, you got that. You, what, what else do you need? But no smile. So money without fulfillment is not enough. Money without spirituality is not enough because you're always going to want more. So without seeking meaning in your life, what happens? Yeah, you think this is what you were chasing, is what is this is what I need. At the end of the day, you realize how far it was. And it clearly showed me. You're in the nicest place, isn't it? You can't get nice, 70 degree weather, <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. And yet it was so hard for a person to smile there. How come? Because there's obviously more than money, it's not the only thing that makes you happy. So you can, and, 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 and again, when you hear the stories, you know, I, I help out a lot of people, but you know, you, you hear the stories of the guy with this addiction, you, you, you think that the wife is living the, the world, the best life in the world, and you hear the stories behind the scenes. So again, it, the instant media is, is just a, a mirage today. So the bread of shame is a concept that we have to work for things. If we don't get the things properly, if we don't receive it with an effort, then specifically that thing will not stay with you. The Arizal says, anything you get in this world without prayer, without, without effort, if it comes to you easy, it's a good chance, easy come, easy go. It's a good chance it's going to go, because you didn't build the vessel for that specific thing. So that's why God gives you obstacles. God gives you obstacles in life so you can start building desire. So you can start building, you, you, you want things. Just like, for example, you have a little kid. You take away the toy from him. What does he do? Give it to me more! You take the kid for an adult? Huh? Not meant to be. Huh? <laughs> Not meant to 
to be. Just like that, you're going to quit? That's not, the, you're supposed to be the little kid that is, is rushing. And that, that lacking in life is supposed to be the thing that gets you closer. But that thing in lacking is an excuse. Instead of making adjustments, people make excuses. So that's from Nachman. If you could take Brestle 101, it's called desire. Desire, desire, desire. Because he's gonna, he's gonna, we're going to speak about here that your actual soul is developed through your desire. Give me a pr practical example. Let's say a person keeps Shabbat. His quality of Shabbat is based on his desire already Thursday for Shabbat. The more he's desiring it, the more he's focused on the holiday, the more he wants the tranquility, is the light that he gets it. Another person, okay, what time is it? Like the candle, blah, 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 blah. He's not getting the same light. Because that person built that desire through that desire, you build the light. So obstacles in life are for the sake of desire. If a person's having a problem with a, with a soulmate, he needs to crank it up. Specifically Miami. Everybody here in Miami is... Not too much desire. Like I say, everybody, usually people get to MIA, their souls go MIA. In New York, they have plenty of desire, but they just don't know how to stop. They don't, they're just too, they want, they just, they don't know how to let God control their life. They're trying to control everything. But Miami, specifically the guys, a lot of the guys, they get lost in this world. They're, 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 it's MIA. No interest in that. But specifically, specifically a guy today, his job is to find the second half of his soul. His job in life is to find. The man got taken the rib from him. So a person has to, if you lost something in life, what do you need to do? You need to go find the lost object. Somebody took your rib. You got to go find it. So it's, a, it's the man's job particularly, through his spiritual rectification, to attract his wife. To attract his wife. What gets in the way is fooling around. Because when you're fooling around, you go this way and she goes that way. So it's like the law of attraction. The more you spiritually work on yourself, the more your soulmate comes here. So you have to focus more on becoming the one than looking for the one. If you're just looking for the one without becoming the one, it's a good chance you're not going to find the soulmate. And that's what we, that's the purpose of, of these, you know, we, we coach a lot of people in singles, is because they're just looking on finding the one instead of looking for the one. I had, I had to chip. I need to find the right wife. I said, you need to become the, ve the, the vessel to become the right wife. Right now, there's no shot you're going to, you, you wouldn't know what a soulmate is if it hit you in the head. But he needs to understand. He needs to become the right one. Otherwise, you're just looking for something that's not going to that's not going to matter. Because if that thing, basically, if God gave you something that was premature, it would ultimately break, and it would be not good for you. So the mercy is that He withhold, withholds it from you. So you build your vessel, and through that building your vessel, you attract what you want. So that's through again. We're gonna, that's through desire. So again, the first concept is is the word is the world is hidden. Obstacles are for the sake of desire, specifically spiritual. Rabbi Nachman clearly says, if you did not receive something, it's because you didn't pray for it, or you didn't pray for it enough. It's not, I got a bad deal. No, you didn't put enough effort. So when you pray like that, an arrogant person is more likely to quit. Because what is he going to say? Ah, I tried. I tried praying a thousand times. Really? A thousand times? How many times did you really pray? Five times. Okay, how long were they? No, five minutes. So I went from a thousand to five minutes at the end of the day. But people always exaggerate. I tried five times, I tried, I can't, I have too much anxiety. So, with, again, you can't, again, how could you find your soulmate if you can't find yourself? Uh, you know? So these are the things that people always exaggerate. So prayer is really the key. That's what I'm not going to focus on, on the relationship with God. Because the relationship with God is allowing you to deal with the darkness. So remember, the concealment in your life, the obstacle for your life, is for the sake of free will. If the system was not made for that, you would have the bread of shame. You would get everything for free. You would be like the person that got invited in the wedding. You would ultimately have so much shame that you couldn't take it. So you, you don't want that. You have to enjoy the obstacle. You have to embrace the obstacle. I said many times, it's impossible for two people to get to the chuppah without having a thorn in the rose. Without obstacles, going, if your first two people are going to meet together and they're going to expect to go and get married and all of a sudden have no obstacles, it's delusion. It's not even, they're set to fail. What we have to say is, listen, 
because anything spiritual, anything holy, it requires obstacles, what happens? Those obstacles are for the sake of, of desire. So when a person thinks, oh my God, uh, I love this girl, but her uncle, is, her uncle has a dog, and that cancels the wedding. You understand? People are canceling the wedding, people are canceling their, for the stupidest things. Like I hear people, this is why you broke off because of this. This is nothing. This is this is uh, my, this is minor leagues. You have to expect anything in spirituality. It's normal. If there's an obstacle, it's specifically because that thing is very important for you. If you're having a problem with food, a food addiction, because you were created in this world to fight that addiction. It could be in a past life you had to you have to fight that. So we come back to repair. Specifically, men come back to repair. Like we said, a man's man's major tikkun is his eyes. A woman's major tikkun, her rectification, is being always being right and having honor. And that never happens, right? So for her for her to forgive somebody, like you have to split the Red Sea. A guy could, could forgive somebody without a problem, but usually women they hold grudges more because their tikkun is is honor. Guys don't have the honor. Guys just want to get it over with. What's the problem? Let me solve it for you. Woman, no, she, she likes the honor. So it, again, that's her tikkun. It's a different tikkun. It's a different tikkun. So usually what we're, what we're here, what we're struggling with, it's not that something's wrong with us. That is what we need to work on. And how do you think you're going to work on? Prayer changes you. It doesn't change the situation. Prayer allows you. That's why the Gemara says, if it wasn't for God created the Yetzirah, and if it wasn't for the, if it wasn't for a person asking for help, he would have no shot against the evil inclination. So it's not that I'm good, I'm bad, I'm this, I'm bad. It's no, I didn't put enough effort. I didn't put enough effort. It's funny they did a, they did a test with kids, and they showed that when kids took tests. They were very careful when, when a person says, Oh wow, you got a good grade. You must be very smart. What happens? The next test was a little harder. So what happens? The kid didn't get a good grade. So what does he say now? I guess I'm stupid now. So the proper way to say it is, No, the reason why you got the good grade is because you put effort. Not because you're smart or you're stupid. You put effort. That's why you score. If you don't put effort, you don't score. We don't want to label people. We don't want to label things because that's exactly the, uh, today. You hear today, oh, the kid's smart. Now he gets one grade off. Now he's not so smart anymore. There goes his self-esteem for the rest of his life. So remember, we want to always say, did you put effort? Then you get good grades. If you don't put effort, you don't get good, good grades. It's very simple. It has nothing to do with your intelligence. When you train people like that, what is, so the kid gets a bad grade, what does he say now? I need to put more effort. It doesn't do with me. It's I'm not putting enough effort in. So this is a spiritual, spiritual thing. So he says here, Rabbi Rush, he says, Therefore the Creator placed man in a world of complete concealment, obstacles, difficulties, physical. I've already told you what I've gone through. Divorces, my son had kids. What, what darkness have I not reached in my life? What darkness have I not reached? But these concealments, are, what am I going to do next? Are you going to approach or are you going to avoid? That is the free will. That is the toughest thing today when a person is dealing with will, specifically spiritually, because he feels he got abandoned. He feels he got abandoned. That's a lot of things about trauma. How could this have happened to me? Where's God in the picture? But the concealment has to happen in order for you to have free will, because otherwise the system wouldn't work. It would be too much light. And like the Zohar says, if you have a light in the middle of the day, what's the point of a light? Why do I need the light in the middle of the day? I need the light in the darkness. So once we're in a concealment and we don't understand, how, how can I practically feel, feel greater than I feel? Only through faith. Faith allows you to go past the present moment. That's why the fight today is faith. That's what today the fight is, is because we constantly have this concealment. So when I have a, when a person says, oh, I'm having a very rough time, it's a concealment. Even the world got created. First there was what? Chaos, and then there was what? Light. Chaos and light. The light always comes. As long as you hang in there. It always comes. As long as you keep the door open for the light. Sometimes if you're in a store, you close the light, you close the door, and then where, where is the light going to come? Where is the light? That's the difference between becoming, God forbid, a victim and becoming a hero. 
So that's the, that's the, so you, a person, it's very important. I, 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 sometimes I go backwards because I can tell you, yeah, fight with the door, obstacles, 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 and then you don't understand the system. If you understand the system, then you're prepared for the rough days, you're prepared for the rainy days, and the good days, you run. There's days you're going to wake up with unbelievable energy, you run. It's not something wrong with you. It's that's the energy of the day. Sometimes the, the mood changes, sometimes in, in the middle of the day, the mood changes. It's so much of this yo-yo pattern, going back and forth. But you shouldn't know it's only you. Everybody goes through it. Because everybody has a test. That's the difference. When I speak to people, I know they're going through darkness. I know they're going through obstacles. There's no perfect life. So when you know that, you, you, you can listen to them, you can become sympathetic. And God sometimes puts you in a situation. He can give a person money, but He puts you in a situation so, because you need mercy. So he makes you give charity to somebody else because you need the mercy. It's always, it happens to me all the time. When I'm in the worst moods in the world, believe it or not, I get in very, 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 because I get tested very, very heavy. That's specifically when people ask me, do you want charity? Listen, I got a headache in my business. The last thing I want to do is go deal with this guy with the charity. But that's exactly what I need to do. Because most of the problem is I'm too much, it's too much self-absorption. But exactly when you don't feel like doing something is when you need to do it. Or somebody says, listen, I need help. Can I have five minutes of your time? I'm like, I can't even get out of my own head right now to even think about helping you. But that's exactly what you need to do. The cre God creates the opportunity for chesed so you can give somebody else mercy so you can need the mercy. You understand? I need the mercy right now. How am I going to get it? Right now I'm too much, I'm thinking only about my problem. I have to get out of my problem. So God gives us opportunities all the time to get out of ourselves. But if we're too moody, what are we going to do? Leave me alone. But if I stop and say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Why is this happening? Why is this person coming to me right now? Maybe God's throwing me a get out of jail free card by helping him. I'm going to get helped. And I see this test all the time. And it's always when I'm in the worst mood. So I get people asking me, I have this cause, I have that cause, I have that cause. Listen, i got to hit my quarter. But that's the thing, you need mercy right now. Worry blocks your pipelines. Worry in life, when you worry about something, what are you trying to do? You're trying to control the outcome of an event. New York 101. Right? They're trying to control. What am I doing when I worry? I'm trying to control. I don't want to let God control it. I want to control it the way I want it. That itself causes your pipelines to be dried up. How do I redo that? Through charity. Because when I'm giving charity, I'm trusting in God. So all of these times where a person's not feeling right, when he's got a negative emotion, it's usually an indication to go outside of yourself. Get outside of you, because you're too self, it's too much self-absorption, which is the cause, it's causing the mess. So if you're aware, you call a timeout, and you say, what do I need to do next? Not, why me? Why am I going through all the time? No, what do I need to do next? Who can I give, who can I give charity to? I know this sounds super normal, super, but this is the whole key, is to get outside of yourself. That is the Torah's message. Whatever you can, get outside of yourself. Because the more you get outside of yourself, specifically when you're not thinking about yourself too much, that is when the solution comes. It's not that the solution, and I, and I see all the time this happens to me, Next thing you know, I'm helping this person out, and all of a sudden, I'm not thinking about myself at that moment. And next thing you know, five minutes later, the same solution to my problem, I get it all of a sudden. How is that possible? How is that possible? Because the awareness that you're, of your problem is, is there. It's just hidden from you. But sometimes what God does is He opens up your mind when you help somebody else out. So even clearly studies have shown that when people are, get outside themselves, get past their problems, and focus on other things, they usually resolve the problem. It's an, um, it's an unbelievable system. Basically, we are wired to give. Another great book by Mir Schechter. And he says something very beautiful. He says, if we understand the way the Torah was created, who the Torah came out of, Rabbi Akiva had 24,000 students. Imagine having 24,000 students. Do you understand the time it took to build 24,000 students? These 24,000 students died within 33 days. All of them died. You would say, listen, I tried. I gave it all I can. They're done. What did Rabbi Akiva do? 
he restarted the Torah with five students. If it wasn't for these, him restarting after having 24,000 students die, there would be no Torah today. There would be nothing today. These five students were Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Rabbi Huda ben Erloi, Rabbi Elazar ben Shamua, and Rabbi Yossi ben Meir. All of these students, you know what happened? The, the, the crash created a new light for a new, five new students, and that's where the Torah is today. You have to understand, the Torah itself, if we take another example, why were the first t- tablets uh, broken? In order for the second tablets. You understand? Everything is always the second. The, the, the disaster, the trauma in your life. What happened? That gave birth to the second. So if we don't have a good, if we're not doing a good job getting up quickly, we end up staying there. The same thing, another great example is Boaz. Boaz had 33 sons, 30 sons and 30 daughters who all died. He didn't invite Manoah to the wedding. What happens? He's six, 30 sons and 30 died. You know what he did at the funeral? That's where he met Ruth. Who end up, who, who, where is Mashiach going to come from? Ruth. So in the funeral, he finds Ruth. In the darkness pit of life is where he finds Ruth. Where, where, where that's where Mashiach comes. What would happen if he would have given up? Do you understand? What would happen if he, he would have given up? So the concept is, is sometimes what we have to say something is, and I'm going to give you a little thing about this book. It's what do we think, how much did we think we gave it? We gave it. Sometimes we say, we, I gave him too much, or I gave him enough, I quit. It's all called perceived effort. You have more to give, but if a person says, I already gave all I can, then what does he say? He stops. So this is the same story as telling him. This is why the Vilna Gaon says that all of our actions in this world, whether physical, spiritual, or compared to planting a seed, all you can do in life is plant and sow. The rain, the rest is up to God. Plant, sow, and get away. And he says something beautiful. Sometimes to have a very beautiful fruit, it takes longer. If you want, sometimes to get the right shiduch, it takes longer. Sometimes you're not going to get the fight. I, 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 I set two people up. She waited five years. Five years to find this guy. And, he, and he, she met him. Just when he got divorced, two months later, three months later, they're married. The whole thing was meant to him. What would say for her? She should say, five years, I'm done. I, had a, I can't do more than five years. Five years this girl was praying. And she got, she, today she, she's a different person. But sometimes for, for that specific guy, she had to wait five years. Other people, you wait, couldn't get a guy for a month, but maybe you'll be divorced in two months after. So the waiting, the struggle, is what actually creates the light, assuming that you're actually putting in the effort. So we need to understand that we can't give up. A person cannot give up because giving up is not an option. That's why Rabbi Nachman says that there's no despair in the world. He clearly says there's no despair in the world. Rabbi Nachman of made a very powerful statement. He's saying that there's no despair in the world. It doesn't exist. Why? Because, it's the, the, because according to Kabbalah, the world was created through the breaking of the vessels. The breaking of the vessels, like we say all the time, that is what created the new light for the new vessel. So if I want a 50-pound chandelier in my house, if the 30-pound chandelier does not break, I can never hang the 50-pound chandelier. In order for me to have a bigger vessel, the older vessel has to break. And I should get excited about the breaking. Because through the breaking, I'm going to be able to what? Build a new one. So when we run away from obstacles, when we run away from challenges, you're basically putting your life on pause. Because what happens? The only way that the new vessel gets built is through what? It's through a, per- through, through a person restarting. And this is what he says here. That even though God pr- repaired the world, the original breakage, He left the world unfinished. God left the world unfinished for us, and our job is to take this order in our life and bring it into order. A person can have an angry husband. She could be a very calm person. What does she need to do? She needs to make him call. person has to always go in a relationship to give. What's missing from my other half? I have to go complete him. And she has to do the same thing. That's why when you have two, op- two opposites, what happens? You, you develop one. That's specifically why you should want the challenge. Not wanting a challenge in life is basically putting your soul on hold and not giving it any oxygen. You would become dehydrated. 
And if you become dehydrated spiritually, where do you think you're going to go get water from? Other things, addictions, depressions, lack of meaning, etc. So the challenge is itself. It gives us the vehicle for the light that's coming into. So that's why Rabbi Rush says, you actually have to thank Hashem for your problems. Imagine that. Imagine having the problem itself, and now you have to thank God for your problem. It sounds so ridiculous, doesn't it? How can I thank God if I don't understand it? It's because you don't understand that the, a new world is being created for you, but you don't see it. And this is why he says here, he's saying here, it's not that the, the information is hidden. Deliverance is not, a, is not, it's not that it's, it's just concealed from you. The solution to the problem of the person is concealed for the person in order for the person to seek the person. Many times in life we find that the answer to our greatest difficulties, whether physical, spiritual, was right under your nose. How do you like that? When I was stuck in my biggest problem in my life, how did I get all my Yeshuot? Waking up at, at 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, meditating, doing Hatzot. You know where the Hatzot was? In my living room. I didn't go anywhere else. It was right in here. Right in front of my house was where my, my, my Yeshua. Right in my house was where, where I had to do, where I started doing his body do. The Yeshua is right underneath my nose. So the proper prayer is to ask God, open up my eyes. Open up my eyes. Don't change the situation. Open up my eyes. Something's hidden from me. I can't see it. How would you get it revealed? Two ways. You can pray to God to open up your eyes, or you can help somebody else with their problems. And now you gave your consciousness to somebody else. What happens? God gives you new consciousness. We always want to go to fresh restaurants. Why? Because there's a good turnover, right? The food's fresh. You have to keep your mind fresh by always giving out what you learn. That's how I grew. That's how most people grow. If you're able to take whatever you learn and give it away, right away, give it away, help people, you're always going to have fresh, fresh knowledge. That's how I can get 700 classes. It's because I'm going, I learn something, I give it away. Okay, I have to get something new. So you're always climbing up spiritually and you're always getting to the edge because you're getting things that are revealed. So it's basically not that we don't have a solution for the problems. It's that the solution is hidden from us and our job is to not say, don't bother me, is to beg God to help us open up our eyes. That is a humble prayer. It's like imagine your kid saying, please open up my eyes, tell me what I'm doing wrong so I can make you happy. You would look at the kid like, what, what, what happened to you? <laughs> right? What happened to you? That's exactly how we have to act to our Creator. Please open up my eyes. It's not that the solution is not there. The solution is right in front of my face. But I have to cry out and ask you for help. That's the purpose. When God created the world, He didn't create the world as a Creator. He says, I'm the one who took you out of Mitzrayim into the house of slavery, and I will be the one redeeming you. Because God did not want, your Creator did not want to say, oh, I created you, you do what you want. He was interested in the relationship. Because when you need something, what do you do? You go to your Creator, and you ask, and then you get what you want. So it's, it's the answer, I, I always tell people, the answer is right in front of your face, but you gotta, you gotta want it. You gotta be hungry. You gotta be hungry. The number one way to be hungry is stop focusing on where you are, and focus on where you want to go. If you focus on only where you are, you're going to get clouded with darkness. Look where I am, look at the goal, I can't take it, too much darkness, there's no hope. If you focus on where you want to go, you tell God, this is where I want to go. This is where I want to go. This is my obstacle, but I'm not looking at the obstacle. I'm focusing on what I become. Who do I become from this challenge? Not, look at my obstacle, look how big my problem is. When you say, look how big my problem is, then what do you want to do? You want to get away from your problem. It's a very, very important concept. This is why Rabbi Nachman says in Lesson 66. He says here, because all of your per he says here, once we want a desire, it's not enough to think about a desire. I actually, everything in, in, in creation has to go through what? Thought, speech, and action. A person cannot just meditate on clouds or meditate on goals. It, can't, it has to come out through speech. The speech itself what do you want? When people tell me, you know, what diet are you on? I said, who do you want to be? I mean, I can give you a di this diet, I can give you that diet. Tell me what you want first, and then I can tell you the diet I, that I can give you. If you don't tell me what you, want, what you want in life, then I can't really give you the diet. 
I mean, you want to, you're, you're telling me you got, uh, you got, uh, you got potato chip stains on your hand, and you tell me what kind of diet you want to be on. Where do you want to be? Where do you want to be? And then I'll tell you where you where you can go. But first, you have to ask, what do you want? That's what God wants. He wants you to express your desire through expressing your desire. That itself creates. It says a person must. He must come first through speech, since all the things entered. Even God created the world. How did He create the world? He created the world, He spoke, and then automatically He removed Himself from the world. Right? He says well, He wanted to create the world, what's the next step? He removed Himself to allow man to become a co-creator. Because otherwise you would have a world with no... With, with no what's the purpose of only light without, a, without free choice? Free choice is what ultimately gives you the award. Free choice is what ultimately gives you the, 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 the vessel for what you want. What you do in your challenges is what gives you the reward in life for every single option. So what God does is, in, is His kindness. Is he, what does He do? He creates obstacles in our lives. He creates darkness in our life. Through those darknesses, because a natural, normal indication that a person wants something is He builds desire. He should say, I want this even more. The fact that if I'm trying to meditate, or if I'm trying to have a conversation with God, and I can't speak, because my mouth is completely shut, and my mind is in la-la land, and I can't even come to this, I should say, I want to speak. I want to give charity. If a person is so broke that he can't give charity, he should scream to God, I want to give charity. Why are you depriving me of giving charity? That's the desire. You have to want it. If a person wants to be in an addiction, I want to give. A person has to say with, with force. It can't just be, I tried, oh, it's too hard, this. You have to let yourself up on fire. That's what God wants. He wants a person's hunger. It doesn't matter if you fail 10 times, but if you're complacent, you're comfortable, it's the worst thing in the world to be comfortable. It's the worst thing in the world. You have comfortable employees, what happens? You show up to work late. I'm sure Ricky can tell you that. You have comfortable employees. It's nothing worse than a comfortable employee. Nothing worse. It's, the big, it's a play. Because now, what do you do? Doesn't want to work. It's not going to grow. You're stuck. Either you tell them, get moving or get out. But comfort is it's, it's, it's against any spirituality. It's, it's, it's nauseating in heaven. That's why whatever, you, whatever a person becomes casual with, he becomes a casualty to. I always say that. You're casual with your diet, you'll become a casualty to diabetes. Until they tell you, listen, I gotta chop off your arm because you're eating too much sugar. Maybe then you'll think about not eating that cake anymore. So people change out of inspiration and desperation. But the whole thing is, this is where I'm not gonna tell them. To the extent of a person's desire, is determined primarily by the obstacle arranged for you. I know my, my obstacle in life is expectations. This is my number one obstacle in life. This is where I have the biggest struggle in my life. So I have to focus more on being in the moment and turning my expectations into appreciation. That's my struggle. I don't have a struggle so much, thank God, with anger. I don't have a struggle, thank God, with food so much. I don't have a struggle with, thank God, other things. But that is my number one struggle. Another person can't even get out of bed. He doesn't care about patience. He doesn't care about growing. He struggles to get out of bed. Another guy struggles to shut his mouth. And stop, calling, stop to arguing with your wife. We all have that. And that obstacle will develop your soul and will open up other doors. Or God forbid, you're going to end up in what? Anger Anonymous. You're going to end up in, God forbid, other places. Because that is what you're here for in this world. The barrier is for the sake of desire. So that you will have a greater desire for that thing. So, when I, people ask me, how do you, I know this is good? How much, I ask them, how much effort did you put into it? Oh, not so much. Then I can't really answer that question. I can't answer that question. Because you're not meant to get it for free. And if it would be for free, it wouldn't be good for you. So usually the struggle you, you, you put into finding a soulmate is that's the shidduch. That's what Rabbi Nachman says. A person's quality of partner is dependent upon his quality of prayer. It's a big deal. 
If you're looking at the horoscope or you're looking at the Siddur, which one you want to do? <laughs> He's a Libra, she's a Cancer, blah, 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 blah. Wonderful. That's all wonderful. You want to spend horoscopes or you want to open up prayer books? Again, I've seen people completely change, but the effort has to become on becoming the one. And that's where, the, that's, where the, that's where the real, real diamonds are hit in life. But if it's just focusing on compatibility with, uh, you know, cancer, with Pisces, or whatever you want to do. <laughs> yeah, there's angry Pisces, there's people, don't, don't worry, just because they're that sign, they still have the to heart. It's not, you're not guaranteed anything because of a horoscope, or you call it, you're not guaranteed nothing in life. But you are guaranteed, if you do put effort into that thing. And this is what he says, the same is true as about anything spiritual. If a, if a person is having a very hard time keeping Shabbat, that's his struggle. That could be the reward that he needs. It's whatever is hard for you. Whatever particularly is hard for the person is specifically where the gold is. That's the bottom line. Because if it was easy for you, then there would be no problem. But that itself, that lacking itself in life, for the addict it's to stay humble. And to be open-minded, and to be careful with it, with with being wanting things too fast, being slowly developing, that is his struggle. So we don't want to judge other people. That's why a person has a food struggle. I can't judge him because I have my own headaches. I have my own headaches. I can't judge him because I know that's what he came to fix. Or another person can't shut his mouth. You have to go underneath and low understand. Listen, I don't have that yetsahar like you do. You have a major Yetzirah, especially if you're Moroccan. But <laughs> you have a major Yetzirah. I don't have that. I don't have that anger issue. So when we, when we, when we sit there and, and, and think like this, then we're, we're able to have to empathy for people. And we're able to connect to them. We don't judge them. That means you, you, we have no position in this world to judge anybody because you know what happens? The Nachman says very clearly, a lot of times a person will suffer because he judges other people. I never forget what happened to me. What, an employee all of a sudden, she complains, oh, here we go, Monday morning, Miami, what's the problem now? What, what happened now? Oh, uh, food, food problem. I got a food stomach virus. Eh, here you go, another food stomach virus. Same thing as this. The next day I got food I stomach virus. <laughs> the next day, I had the same thing she got. So we have to be very careful. You have to be very careful because the, your natural indication is to judge. And, you, and it's teaching you, if you're an impatient person, you have to have more empathy. If you're a person who's an angry person, he has to work on his patience. If a person has a problem with food, he has to work on self-control. But it's not like you're better than anybody else. This is the package you got. Amazon gave you this package, you got that package, and you got that package. So it's not like everybody's got it free. And if they're telling you they're free, they're faking it completely. We all have our struggles, but we come to closer to God and we become humble. Because we know that when we struggle, the only person that can help us is our Creator. And that's what the whole thing about the 12 steps, it's all going back to your source. That's what, what is recovery? I'm recovering back to myself. Teshuva, going back to yourself. That's the whole purpose. Of, so when you, when you do this, you don't focus on anybody else, you stay in your lane. I don't want his problem, I don't want jealous of that problem, I don't want that problem, of that problem. You stay in your lane and you focus on what you need to do, and that's where you get results. Alright, that's today's class. Thank you.